welcome everybody and bless you today. May his love, his joy, his shalom and his fatherhood touch you today. Well, today is the last of the Grumble Fast series, but it won't be the last I speak about the importance of praise. I can assure you of that. Things are escalating quickly. The world has entered a most trying of times. And praise is a powerful way to look up to our Redeemer and our soon coming King. Jesus is coming soon. And in his presence, we are strengthened. We are changed. We hear his voice. And we see things from his perspective, sobering, sobering realities that are taking place in our world, we see from his point of view. Psalm 83 verse 46 says, Lord, all your enemies are stirred up in an uproar. That's a good description of today, isn't it? They are all stirred up in an uproar. And he says, in their defiant arrogance, they rise up to host their secret counsel against your people. Our enemies keep saying, now's the time to wipe Israel off the map. We'll destroy even the memory of her existence. They've made their pact, consulting and conspiring, aligning together in their covenant against God. Then the psalmist goes on and, and speaks about times in the Old Testament when God has defeated the enemies. And then the psalmist says, repeat history, God. <laughs> repeat history. I like that. Lord, repeat history. Make them out of failures and everything they do so, and this is the reason for that prayer, so they will know that you and you alone are Yahweh, the only most high God exalted over all the earth. And though nations gather against Israel, the Lord wins. And even in the midst of the grumble fast, we must look at reality. And in the midst of that, we give him thanks for who the Lord is. But more and more every day, it seems the Ezekiel 38 war is quickly falling into position. According to the book of Daniel, the enemy seeks to wear out the saints, to tire us out, but also to change times and seasons. These are not his to change, but he tries. He tries to manipulate circumstances to preempt God's timetable for these wars of the Antichrist. As believers, we must hold the line in prayer and praise and be in agreement with God's timetable. In 2013, we were in Israel and praying around the Golan Heights. And I remember specifically the Lord saying, hold back in prayer. The enemy is trying to preempt war. And there was a lot of things happening as there always is. And so we just prayed that the Lord would hold the hand, that the enemy would not be able to do things ahead of time. And he did. He answered those prayers, not just of us, but many others. The enemy is sending many arrows of accusation to stir up trouble, spread disease and cause us to falter in doubt and fear. But Psalm 64 says this, all the while God has his own fire tipped arrows. Suddenly without warning, they'll be pierced and stuck down. Staggering backward, they'll be destroyed by the very ones they spoke against. The lovers of God will be rejoicing in the Lord. They'll be found in his glorious presence, singing songs of praise to God. And this is a really important scripture relating to praise being a weapon. So after the first song, I will impact a f- unpack a few of these thoughts before getting into the last week of Grumble Fast. But in these troubling days, where there are great pressures on believers, we must build our spirit men. And two strong ways to be strong in the Lord and place our gaze upon him is to feast on the word and be secure in a lifestyle of praise. So the first song is again from the CD where where the songs were written in an Afghan prison. And this song's called In the Shelter of Your Presence. Hallelujah. Be strong and take heart because he keeps us safe in his presence. Back to Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 wars against Israel. These scriptures actually list different ethnicities and people groups and often thought about as different wars. But I want to allude to both of them right now because simply with both of them, all roads lead to Israel. And the heart of the matter, the heart of the issues, although these are all different players in the Middle East, the heart issues of Psalm 83 and Psalm 64 is this, a common hatred of God and his people. And ultimately, it's aimed at Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, 
he's the ultimate enemy. We know as of August the 31st, 2021, Afghanistan is in the hands of the Taliban. And many US citizens and co-workers are trapped even hostages. Geopolitically dangerous alignments are forming and we can see the Prince of Persia back operating, as in the book of Daniel. China has recognised the Taliban. A USA airbase that was given away is just 400 miles from China on one direction and 500 miles from Iran, the other direction. If you think about it, that's about between Melbourne and Goulburn. It's not that far. Turkey has made agreements with Taliban, including reports that Turkey will operate the Kabul airport. Turkey also wants to re-establish the Ottoman Empire. That's no secret. The Taliban is currently transferring US military vehicles to Iran, and Iran is just weeks away from nuclear capability. The huge amount of US equipment left behind is serious. It's so advanced, Russia and China will probably vie for access to the technology that they don't have at present. North Korea has reactivated its nuclear sites. The Taliban Twitter account says they have actually renamed Afghanistan. They're calling it the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan, and they call themselves the Black Flags from Khorasan. And this is based on a Islamic prophecy where it says nothing will repel us until we set up our flags in Jerusalem. And then they will call the nations to gather to their flag. It is a um, Islamic prophecy where they believe in the final Mahdi, which in Christian prophecy, this equates really with the Antichrist. What is developing is a land bridge from China through Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, all the way to Israel. And of course, China being a very big winner. But God, and I need to state, but God. Many years ago, we were privileged and invited to go to the Silk Road in China, the city of Xi'an, to pray and worship with many from the Back to Jerusalem movement. And I spoke about the Key of David at this place. And we met with many from the Back to Jerusalem movement, which is basically a vision God gave to many of the Chinese believers, and many of them laid their lives down for it, for the gospel to travel this route from China through Pakistan, Afghanistan, all through these ways back to Jerusalem. And it's interesting within days of the Taliban uh, taking over that the church started multiplying. Even though there were Christians are being hunted down, one report said the church had already multiplied times seven. Already. Times seven. If that's correct, and I can't v validate that, that it's exactly correct because it's hard to get exact information. But it's interesting because in Proverbs it says, the thief must pay back times seven. And so my prayer is that for every person that's martyred, for every person that's tortured and killed, may there be another seven brought into the kingdom of God. May the church literally explode times seven in Afghanistan. And one thing that this situation reveals to us, both militarily but also for spiritual warfare, it's a lesson to us. You need to know your enemy. When you ignore, discount what the enemy is saying, when you don't study how the enemy operates, and make flimsy presumptions on those, you will get hurt. People will get hurt. Knowing where your enemy is, its tactics, its strengths and weakness, these are vital to victory. And sadly, many in the church have been asleep as to what we currently face. And so I believe the Lord is really trying to give a wake-up call to us. And I, I thank God that so many are waking up to pray and saying we must pray to get out of this situation. But we need to really understand what the enemy is after. And Paul gives several warnings about spiritual warfare. It's the defensive protection as well as the weapons of offense. And um, we will go into further of this in, in coming weeks. But Psalm, back to Psalm 64. The psalmist says, keep me safe from the conspiracy of these wicked men. Can't you hear their slander, their lies? Their words are like poison-tipped arrows shot from the shadows. They are unafraid and have no fear of consequences. They persist with their evil plans and plot together to hide their traps. They boast, no one can see us or stop us. But 
All the while, God has his own fire-tipped arrows. Suddenly, without warning, they will be pierced and struck down. Staggering backward, they will be destroyed by the very ones they spoke against. The lovers of God will be rejoicing in the Lord. They will be found in his glorious presence singing songs of praise to God. And it's interesting that this fiery-tipped arrows of the Lord links to Psalm 149 where it speaks about worship being a significant weapon against the enemy. It speaks about binding the kings with chains and the Hebrew word for, for the chains in Hebrew is fiery arrows. And so our praise and our worship releases in the spirit realm fiery arrows against the enemy. And so I just want to encourage you today in the midst of all of these things that we give praise to the Lord because it's releasing and activating heaven's hosts and the Lord to release all that his arrows that are needed in this time. So Karen Davis sings this beautiful song, We Bow Down, Her Do Lad and I, which in English means give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His mercy endures forever. Forever and ever, the Lord is good. Well, day 36 and day 37 of the Grumble Fast is gratitude for people in your life. And hasn't being in lockdown really made us appreciate the people in our lives, especially when you can't see them? And it's it has helped us. But on day 36, we are giving thanks for the people who are gifts and day 37, we give thanks to, for people who help us to grow pearls. So in Ephesians 5.20, it says, Always give thanks to Father God for every person he brings into your life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Always give thanks for every person God brings into your life. So everyone in your life God has brought in, yes, Consider all the people in your life, not just the ones you like who are kind to you, but all of them. How do you see them? You know, some people are such a blessing to us and others can be a little bit prickly. But, you know, every single person is created in the image of God and is loved by him. Can we see each person as someone that Jesus has died for, as a gift given to us? by the loving father. When we're in the grumbling mode, it contaminates the lens of how we see people. You know, when we're in that operand, modus operandi of grumbling, the weaknesses and faults of our nearest and dearest seem to get larger and more irritating. Worse still, our grumbling infects the atmosphere around us. On the other hand, if we're in gratitude, we see the best in people. We see their strengths and their gifts. And we realise these people are a blessing to us. And there really are two groups of people mostly. And sometimes some people fit into both categories. First of all, there's those who bless us. They bring us great joy. They compliment us. We can co-labor together. They encourage you. They help you. It's easy to see that they are a gift from God. Some people don't just make your life better. They actually like make life workable and bearable and really a blessing. So... Think of these people and thank the Lord for them today and how they have enriched your life, how he's really blessed you with them. And take some time today to really give thanks for these people. The second group of people is what I call those who have a special sandpaper anointing. (laughs) Sandpaper, they can rub you up the wrong way. These precious ones have an amazing ability to rub us. They know how to needle us. Maybe that's not deliberate, but they're like irritants and it's easy to see their faults. We could easily and gladly itemise all the things they need to fix. But consider how pearls are made. Every time an irritating speck afflicts an oyster, it protects itself by coating the irritation with a mineral substance. These irritations can be as simple as a grain of sand, small but irritating to the oyster. Irritation after irritation is covered by a mineral substance. And the oyster produces layers of these mineral substances over each irritation until a pearl is formed. 
There are some people in our lives that force us to press hard into God for his grace, for his mercy and his forgiveness. Maybe some of these people have caused you to see things in yourself you didn't see before. So it's a gift from God. It is said that the things that anger us about others are often the things that anger us about ourselves. But Proverbs says, love covers a multitude of sins. So you've got a choice. You can grumble about these dear people or let his pearls grow in you. Just think as you extend love over those irritations, it allows pearls to grow in us. So give thanks for them today and just thank the Lord for all the pearls that you're growing in your character. And so you can thank him for the people that are such a blessing to you and as such a joy. You can also thank the Lord for those that are helping you to grow pearls. So we're going to listen to Terry McKelman as we think about those thoughts. Jesus' name above all names. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, name above all names. We praise his name today. Day 38 of the Grumble Fast is about the spirit wind and the glory light. In Genesis 2, 7, it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. John twenty twenty one. Jesus said to them, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. God breathed on dirt and created Adam and the human race. Jesus breathed on his disciples and the Holy Spirit filled their lungs. The Hebrew word for the Holy Spirit is Ruach Kadosh. I just love the Hebrew. I probably don't say it as well as those that speak the language, but you can even hear the, the breath in the Ruach, the, breath, the wind, the breath. And we know that without breath, we die. Without the breath of God, we don't live. At creation, the breath of God brooded over the darkness and the chaos. And then light was called forth and order came into being. John eight twelve, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus is the only light, true light. And only he can bring us out of darkness that is in the world today. I love the description of Jesus in Revelation 1. It says, his face shines as bright as the noonday sun. And in Revelation 21, 23, it says there's no need for sun or moon in heaven because the glory of God is its light and its lamp is the Lamb of God. It's quite stunning graphic pictures of the description of Jesus, of the intensity of the light. No wonder Saul, as he saw the light of God, was blinded to see his light in the fullness of it is so intense. So in heaven, no need for sun or moon or electricity because Jesus is the light. And it's that light that he says we can come to for help, for guidance, for direction. It's interesting that the natural light of sun and moon also praise him. In Psalm 65, verse 8 to 13, it says, O Lord, your sunrise brilliance and sunset beauty Take turns singing their songs of joy to you. Your visitations of glory bless the earth. The grazing meadows are covered with flocks and the fertile valleys are clothed with grain, each one dancing and shouting for joy, creation celebration. They're all singing their songs of praise to you. And actually with the NASA telescopes out there and they're just about to put new ones that will be, be able to find even more things, they can actually hear the sun and every time it flares, they say it's like a guitar string sounding. And so in nature itself, there's actually sounds. And so the psalmist, even without the benefit of the telescope, is saying the sunrise and the sunset are singing songs of praise to you. We know we're all blessed by the beautiful sunrises and sunsets. And yet here it is, they're saying that they are celebrating the creator, 
singing songs of praise. Isaiah 60 gives us another thought on this. It says, look carefully, darkness blankets the earth and thick gloom covers the nations. But Yahweh arises upon you and the brightness of his glory appears over you. The end times, and we're certainly seeing this darkness covering the earth day to day. It can grip us with fear if we're not careful. But the darkness is, is so pervasive. But it says his light shines upon his people. He's speaking about Israel, but it's also his people that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And his breath and his light are both creative and destructive. As I said, he breathed in dirt and the human race began. He breathed in the disciples and they became a force to be reckoned with. But the same breath and light that brought order out of chaos and creation out of disorder and a small band to turn the world upside down can also be used to wipe out God's enemies. In 2 Thessalonians 2.8, it says, The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and with the brightness of his coming. That's just such a comforting thought, isn't it? That the Lord will consume even the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. His breath vaporizes the enemy. When Jesus, who is light, appears in his brightness, the evil one is destroyed and rendered useless and made to vanish. The scripture is in the context of the Antichrist or the lawless one. So be encouraged. When overwhelming evil is rampant, the Lord's breath and his light consume the enemy. Amen. We're going to listen to two tracks now. Karen Davis singing Yeshua, Yeshua and Terry McCalman singing the song we know well, Exalt the Lord Our God. Yes, Lord, holy are you. We exalt your holy name today. Well, day 39 of the Grumble Fast, our heavenly lawyer and high priest. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points test tempted as we are, yet without sin. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, brings a blood sacrifice and intercedes for the souls of men at the mercy seat. Akin to the heavenly courtroom, the high priest goes before the righteous judge, as particularly for the nation. If we are accused of something and taken to court, you want the best available lawyer or attorney to defend you. And the scripture says that the devil accuses us 24-7. But God has provided us with the most qualified high priest, intercessor, lawyer to be found in the universe. Having Yeshua as our heavenly attorney is so reassuring. He simply says when the enemy accuses us, I paid the price. And he prays for us. He prays for us. He's the perfect high priest, advocate, intercessor. His sympathy and understanding does not cause him to excuse or wink at sin, for he is righteous. But neither does he condemn us to destroy us. Rather, his kind understanding embraces us even in the midst of failure, but he draws us with his kindness and his love to come back to the Father and to restore our hope and to lift us up so we too can be overcomers. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. But we do not know what we should pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The description of the Holy Spirit's intercession suggests travail. His prayer is deep, comprehensive, far greater than we could pray for ourselves. Praying with groaning is like the pain and sorrow of childbirth. Travail is so deep, words fail. Travail is bringing something to birth in the spirit. It's taking new ground and thus overcoming resistance to coming into destiny. It's interesting in Exodus 17 verses 8 to 16, there's a story of where Moses was interceding during the battle with the Amalekites and Joshua was down in the valley actually fighting them in the natural and the, the arms of Moses got tired and it says that Aaron and her held up the arms of Moses until victory was secured. 
And sometimes people will do that for us. They'll hold our hands up in prayer. But think of it like this. Jesus as high priest and the Holy Spirit hold up our arms in intercession until victory is secured. When we are tired, when the devil's plans to wear us down with tiredness and we're battle fatigued or discouraged, they are holding our arms up. Over our lifetime, there will be times we need someone to travail for us and at other times we need a prayer attorney. Defence and offence are both needed for victory. And you know those times where you go, oh, I really need someone to pray for me right now? Be reassured. Holy Spirit and Yeshua are praying for you today. And what a beautiful, comforting thought is that, knowing that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are praying for us. Hallelujah. Day 40, the provision for every need. Philippians 4.9 says, My God shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Romans 6.4 says, It was the glory of the Father that raised Jesus from the dead. So all of our needs are met in his glory, whether it's financial or emotional or even to the ends of needing resurrection life. There's a story in Israel at the moment of a pastor fighting for life. He's already had one victory. They said he actually died and has been resurrected and they're scratching their heads. And um, so in the glory realm is full of provision, full of the provision that we need. His glory contains everything we need. Needs are not restricted to finances, even though that's what we often think of. It can be healing for our bodies and especially our minds. So many people are struggling in the lockdowns with the affliction of, of thoughts and, and, and the mental uh, stresses. It can be a relationship that's in need of healing and restoration. Dead things, people and circumstances can come to life from his glory. Don't try to work out how he'll do it, but just give him thanks for the provision in his glory. Keep thanking him and keep thanking him. Give thanks to God for the need you have for which he will get the glory. So Shane and Shane sing, Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is with us in the fiercest battles. Be reassured of that today. Be reassured the Lord of hosts is with us. Day 41 of the Grumble Fast says the devil is defeated. Now that's worthy of a good shout. <laughs> 1 John 3, 8 says the reason the Son of God was revealed was to undo and destroy the works of the devil. This is one of my favorite scriptures, or both of these scriptures I'm going to read. The reason the Son of God was revealed was to undo and destroy every work of the devil. In Colossians 2.15, it says, Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power, governments and authority to accuse us. By the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. Those two scriptures alone should get us through anything. As an artistic person, I'd love to see a dramatic enactment of those two scriptures. When Jesus stripped the devil of all his weapons and all his power, you could just imagine the script, drop your weapons. <laughs> and to be a witness of the victory parade, that Yeshua led the demonic hordes as his prisoners of war. It goes on to say they were his prisoners. He was not theirs. The devil thought he'd won, but Jesus rose from the dead. It was checkmate. I used to love playing chess, trying to outsmart my brother's moves, but the Lord is the expert chess player. Remember Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought, He'd let the people of Israel go and then he chased them into the Red Sea and he thought, I've got them this time. But God turned what looked like defeat for Israel into victory and Pharaoh was drowned. A horse and rider, he was thrown into the sea. These are not just stories. These are times when God moved on behalf of Israel. What about Haman? He built the gallows. He had a plan to destroy Israel. And God turned it around and he hung on his own gallows. What about Goliath? 
taunted Israel. And we know so many stories that are not just stories, incidences when God delivered his people and turned it around and defeated the devil. Psalm 32 verse 7 says, Lord, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Many times when we go into praise, they are songs of deliverance. As I said, it activates angels. It activates the heavenly host to work on our behalf. At the start of the program, I spoke from Psalm 64 about the slanderous words of wicked men are like poison-tipped arrows shot from the shadows. But all the while, God has his own fire-tipped arrows that the Lord suddenly, without warning, would pierce and struck them down. The lovers of God would be found singing songs of praise to God. Death could not hold Jesus. He rose from the grave. The devil would never have crucified the Lord of glory if he had realized what was really going on. Jesus overcame death even in the midst of it. And as we give him praise and we honor his victory at the cross. As we honour that and we sing praises to him in the midst of our own trials, the Lord turns those songs of praise into songs of deliverance. Many times we've seen these songs of deliverance. Remember one time being in Jerusalem in the midst of many terror attacks and we did three days of worship in a church. We had to lock the doors. And on the second day, the Arabs called a day of rage so we weren't even allowed to go up to the, the the gates of the city so we had to stay inside but on the third day calm came to the city in such an amazing way that the cover of our album welcome king of glory is an actual photo that we took at that time normally to go to the golden gate which is closed one or two people praying there will really cause an angry scene That day, 200 of us took big drums, banners and worshipped the Lord for an hour without disturbance. That was a miracle. That was a miracle. And three days of just praising the Lord brought deliverance, turned the rage into peace. And I could tell you many other stories. Day 42, you are a conqueror. Romans 8.37 says, yet in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us to be more than conquerors. His demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. In the midst of life's trials, and we've got a few of them at the moment, we can easily feel discouraged and wonder if we will survive. We may even be tempted to let go and succumb to the winds of defeat. When life threatens our health, our finances, relationships, confidence and even our faith, Do we get blown away or do we stay holding onto the rock? Yeshua, our Messiah. Paul encourages us that we can triumph even in the midst of the storm. Being a conqueror is not about denying there's a storm or avoiding them. But being a conqueror is surviving the storm. And when the wind subsides, you're found to be still secured to the rock. If we remain holding on to him, that is a victory, especially in some situations. The Greek word used for conqueror is herpaniko and means to gain a decisive victory. It is not just surviving, but it means to prevail. In a court law, sorry, in a court of law, it would be the equivalent of winning a case and then going on to get a huge payout as well. In war, it's not just to defeat the opposing enemy, but to possess new land. So we just encourage you with this song. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord in the midst of it all. That's the voice of the beautiful Michael Ben David, a beautiful worship leader from Israel, married to an Australian lady. Well, keep the praises up this week and the Lord bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you as you... Praise him in the midst of it all. Amen.